uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Matt, for inviting me here. I'm thrilled to get the opportunity to discuss uh, this issue with you and Professor Kaplan. So I want to say at the outset that I'm not an advocate for closed borders. Uh, my parents are from different countries, and if it weren't for um, somewhat porous borders, I wouldn't be standing uh, here before you. Um, I actually think that most countries, including the United States, would be better off, uh, and humanity as a whole would be better off if we had more porous borders. But I am an unapologetic defender of a legitimate state's right to set and enforce its own immigration policies. And that's uh, why I was invited. So let me explain how I came to that conclusion. The three basic premises. Uh, the first is that legitimate states are entitled to political self-determination. The second is that freedom of association is an integral component of self-determination. So if you don't have freedom of association, you don't have uh, self-determination. Uh, and the third is that freedom of association includes the right not to associate with others. So I'll get to the first in a bit, but let me just explain the second and third of these uh, in terms of a, a sort of a domestic everyday example. Uh, think about my right to get married. I wouldn't have a full freedom of association in the marital realm just if I was allowed to get married. It has to be true that I can pick or reject potential suitors. Right. So my father is some of, you know, my father, he's much uh, more wise than I. He might be able to do a better job picking a life partner than I could. Uh, it might be that my life would go better if he could choose uh, my spouse. Uh, but I wouldn't be self-determining. I wouldn't be the author of my own life in a very fundamental sense unless I was able to reject his choice, anyone else's choice, any potential suitor. Right. So it seems natural. Uh, and commonsensical to say that uh, in order to be self-determining, in order to be the author of our own lives, we have to be able to form associations, but also reject potential associations, right? Uh, and if you don't have that opportunity to reject uh, prospective associates, you're not self-determining. What does that have to do with states? I think the same thing applies to legitimate states. So take Norway, for instance. Right, Norway. It seems to me, if anything, any state is a good candidate uh, for a legitimate state, it's Norway. Um, I think Sweden seceded from Norway in 1905. Maybe they bitterly regret it now, and they say, "We'd like to get back together." Right? Norway says, eh, "No, thank you." Right? They say, "No, really, we want to get back together." And could Sweden forcibly annex Norway to reunite? It seems not. It seems that you, the Norwegians as a whole have the right to either accept or reject that merger. Or think about the European Union. The European Union might go, as it has, to Norway and say, look, we'd be stronger with you and we think you'd be stronger with us. Won't you join as a full member of the European Union? It seems to me that it's Norway's call whether or not they want to be part of the Union. And the European Union doesn't have a right to forcibly annex Norway. Right? So Norway has on at least two occasions held a plebiscite and the people of Norway decided they don't want to be members of the European Union. Okay? And that seems to me very commonsensical. It seems to me Norway has the right. And if either Sweden or the European Union tried to forcibly annex Norway, they would be wrongly forcing an association on them and wrongly disrespecting the self-determination to which they're entitled as the legitimate state. But if that's true, now imagine there are prospective immigrants that want to come into Norway, right? Maybe there are Swedes that want to come into Norway. Maybe there are Europeans that want to come into Norway, right? It's Norway's call whether they want to include them as members in their political community, right? Just as it changes the constitution of a country if it, if it merges with Sweden or becomes a part of the European Union, the self that is self-determining changes right, uh, when new members are brought in. So in a very important component of Norway's right to self-determination is the right to exclude prospective members if it doesn't want to include them. Again, I'm not advocating this. I'm not saying what type of position Norway should take with respect to reuniting with Sweden or joining the European Union or letting in any prospective immigrant, right? I'm saying as a legitimate state, it's their call. All right, so my view is that for legitimate states, there is a right to set and, uh, and then enforce 
um, its immigration policies. But it's very important that it's merely a presumptive right. It's not the only thing that matters. Brian was very good to acknowledge that he's not an absolutist about human rights. Uh, and I'm certainly not an absolutist about uh, political self-determination. So you might say, fine, uh, under ideal circumstances, maybe Norway has a right uh, to set its immigration policies. But look around the world, Kit. Right? We are far from ideal circumstances. And so many people are so much worse off. We're not just talking about Swedes who have a spectacular um, a standard of living, but we're talking about people around the world in developing countries who would um, go to extraordinary lengths and make extraordinary sacrifices to be able to live within the sheltered confines of a well-oiled liberal democracy in uh, such an efficient government. And when you have people on the outside who, whose life prospects are so much worse off for no uh, reasons of their own doing, it's just because they happen to be born on the other side of a border, surely global justice is more important right, than freedom of association. And I have a lot of sympathy for this, right? But I, and I do think that uh, it may be that country, wealthy Western uh, countries like Norway should be doing more in terms of global justice, should be doing more for the global poor. But what I want to emphasize is whatever those duties of distributive justice are, they're distinct from and can be kept separate from rights of freedom of association. So think about Bill and Melinda Gates, for instance. They're doing spectacularly well. I'd love to be part of the Gates family, right? Because they're doing so much better than I, does that mean that I have a right to join their family or they have to adopt my children? Presumably not, right? If they have duties, to help people who are less fortunate than they, they can discharge those duties in ways other than integrating them into the family. They can transfer money out to others, right? This, again, just seems commonsensical. I'm, I don't know exactly what kind of duties of distributive justice the Gates have, but take your favorite theory, whatever it is, right? They can transfer that money to the people. They don't have to op literally open their homes to people, uh, no matter how desperate those people are. But if we, we recognize that commonsensical position in the domestic realm, why shouldn't we say the same thing in the geopolitical context, right? Whatever we think Norway and Norwegians own to people who, through no fault of their own, are much worse off around the world, it doesn't seem like that debt has to be paid in the currency of open borders, right? The Norwegians may want to open their borders, and I have no objection to that, right? But what I'm insisting is that if they prefer to jealously guard their borders, they can discharge their debt by transferring money elsewhere or transferring resources or helping people or giving refugees the refuge they need elsewhere. All right. So even uh, it, in, in the real world where we've got stark inequalities and perhaps um, very stringent duties of uh, global distributive justice, I think that doesn't def defeat the case, the presumptive right, to exclude outsiders. Two minutes. What about refugees? You can't just send refuge in a box, right, uh, in the way that you can send money. So it looks like that might be um, a counterexample. It might be that, well, generally you can help those people who are less fortunate where they are, but you've got to allow refugees to immigrate. I don't think so, right? I agree that refuge, we cannot turn our backs on refugees. But what refugees have a right to is refuge. They don't necessarily have a right to be uh, permanent members of our society. So if refugees can be helped where they are, right, then you should do so. If they can't, you may allow them temporarily into your country, right, try and fix the problem where they are. And if you can fix it, there's nothing wrong with returning them. So think about the Kurds, for instance, in northern Iraq, who were vulnerable to genocide by um, Saddam Hussein's Ba'athist regime, right? They certainly needed protection. One of the things you could have done is allow all the Kurds to migrate to the United States. The other thing you could do is set up a safe haven with a no-fly zone in northern Iraq so that they are, in fact, secure where they are. And if there are plenty, and there are plenty of cases where you can't do that, uh, and then you can go in and maybe restructure things there. And you say, well, isn't that contrary to your uh, principle of uh, political self-determination? No, because I think the only states that are entitled to political self-determination are legitimate states. And any country which is either causing or failing to protect those people who need refuge 
are not legitimate states. Uh, so uh, to conclude, um, I'm not interested in excluding folks. I wouldn't advocate for it, but I do believe that legitimate states have a presumptive right to exclude outsiders. And surprisingly, uh, this right is not defeated even in the case of stark inequalities or necessarily defeated when there are refugees on the outside. Thank you.